I don't want to ever treat my Heavenly Father as common. I don't want to become so familiar with his, with his, with his presence that I mistreat it, mistreat him. I, I, I tend toward being very jovial, playful in every setting I'm in. And there are, you know, I've many, know many people and most of, the, most of them would say that I, I don't know how to be serious. It's not really true. I'm very serious. But all I, all, all I know how to do is respond to the presence of God the way I've been taught. And, and the Lord has never made me change who I am to approach him. So as long as he allows me to be relaxed and playful, <laughs> I'm probably going to stay that way. But if you were to look at the outside of that and, and, and think that because of that playfulness, that jovial nature, that relaxed exterior that you perceive and say that, oh, he's not serious, you would be very wrong. You'd be very wrong. I'm only serious, completely serious about a few things. My Heavenly Father, Lacey, and my four children. Everything else it has a context. It has an expiration date on it. And it doesn't mean I don't love or appreciate everything else, but those are the things that I am very, very serious about all the time. And I, I just want God's will to be done in my life more than anything I'm not pursuing dollars I'm not pursuing um, power I'm not pursuing uh, relationships with certain people I, I, I'm, I just want the will of God to be done that's all, I'm, that's all I want. And in the context of the things that I am most, I care about the most, I want to see the will of God done in my life, in my wife, and in my children. If, the, if there's nothing else that I feel like I'm responsible for as a man on this planet, I know I'm responsible for that. That's what I'm responsible for. Now, obviously, my children have, will have the opportunity to make their own decision about their relationship with God as they grow, as they, and as, as they should, as they should. They, they must choose. We all must choose whether we're going to serve the Lord. But at this time, and at this time in their life, my, my wife and I are the strongest influence in their life. I want them to be very conscious and serious about their relationship with God. Well, they're children, so? Jesus said that except ye be converted and become as little children, So that's, I, I want to help them 
become all that God wants them to become in this life. I want the will of God to be done in their life. I want the will of God to be done in my life, in my wife. And as, as that, that's where I know I'm responsible. And then, as, as Paul said, there is the care of the churches. those that are called upon by God to to lead in the body of Christ, we can't simply stop at leading our families. We must also lead in the body. We must lead our families in the body and be a model for apostolic ministry, for relationship with God. We've been throwing around this this term being apostolic for a while now, and I I think it's a a really good point. I I think I prefer to be be like what Paul said. I would rather be like Jesus. I'm not trying to follow a fad of apostolic ministry. I'm not trying to follow a I want to be like Jesus. That's something that I can see clearly here in the Word. That's something that it's not that I'm always challenged by every single day. It's something that my family and I talk about around the dinner table. We talk about it in the car. We we we, we this is this is our life. Our our life force is our relationship with God. And we must, we, we must grow, we must lead, and there, there are things. So all, all that is a precursor. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 9, I want to continue something that the Lord had me speak about here several weeks ago. And I stopped at the beginning of Matthew chapter 10, but we're, uh, I felt to come back to this as a starting point for wherever the Holy Ghost wants to go this evening. I, I will tell you at the outset, I am not expecting a response from you. In fact, I'm hoping that you think this is very boring. I really am. I'm hoping you think it's boring and dry. But what my faith is, this is the faith the Lord has given me for today, and that is to give you something to think about and pray about so that your life can change. That's my, what my faith and hope are is for, for this evening. So let's start with Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Brother Nathaniel, whenever your fingers are tired, you can give up on that. Uh, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Please stay seated. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. We didn't misread that. He preached the gospel of the kingdom and he healed every disease and every affliction. Does every leave out anything? Jesus had a very powerful and effective ministry. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. I'm reading from the ESV, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Can you keep this one on the screen for a while, please? Thank you. 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, we're going to get to this later, but in the latter parts of the Gospels, there is this passage that is known as the Great Commission. Specifically, the first time it's referenced is in the end of Matthew chapter 28. But if you read through the Gospels, what you'll find is that for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples at different times and taught them, preached to them, ministered to them. So the Great Commission didn't simply take place once. It was something that took place multiple times. There was four different, four to five, depending on if you count Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 8, um, so if counting that, there's five different references to this, spe- this specific time frame that happened where Jesus ministered to his disciples. And there were some, there were some reasons for that, and we'll, we, we may get into some of that. We may get into some of that later, but the the... the The kicker or the the thing that we must remember is that the Great Commission was the final time that Jesus separated himself, his physical presence, from his followers, his disciples. But it wasn't the first time. It wasn't the first time. So what we're about to find in Matthew chapter 10 is the, is the 12 disciples are about to be sent out as apostles, sent out to do the work of the kingdom. And before he does this, he says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, I have a question. I have a question. I do want, I want you to raise your hand if you see something different in the text. Does anybody see here where an evangelistic gifting is needed to be qualified as a laborer? Does anybody see that? Let me see your hand. It's not there. Okay. Thank you, Brother Bart. You're right. It's not there. How about, um, does anybody see needing to be a pastor? to qualify as a laborer. Is that there? Okay, let's, let's try to... What about a prayer warrior? Does that... So you don't have to have a particular title to be considered a laborer in the harvest. This is something that Jesus expects all of his followers to do. This is something he expects all his followers to do. So chapter 10, verse 1. In fact, let's go back, sorry. Chapter chapter 9, verse 37. Let's read that again, verse 38. Just You can't get away from it. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Before I move on. I really want to move on, but I can't yet. This verse has become something that I have used as a tool for my prayer life more than it ever has before. Because I'm limited to 24 hours in a day, seven days a week. Eight hours, five days a week is slotted for my employer. And then the rest of that time in the will of God is, is, 
is redeemed with my family or in, or in a place of ministry. But this, this, this verse here is powerful because it gives you the opportunity to participate with the harvest in prayer. It gives you the opportunity to participate with the harvest in prayer. I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but between here and east and going east, there's not a single apostolic church. I'm not sure if you're not aware of it, whether you're aware of it or not, but going west of Anne Arundel County, there is, I know of one, nope, that's PG. I don't know of a single apostolic church in Howard County. Doesn't mean there's not one, but there, there may be one. I don't know of one. These are, th th those areas are an opportunity for us to participate with the Lord in prayer, praying, Lord, send forth laborers into your harvest field. Now that word, that word send forth means to thrust out. It's similar, it's similar to, to almost to the broadcasting of the seed in the parable of the sower. It is to thrust out, to send it out with purpose. So this is something that the Lord has dealt with me about to, to pray daily for the areas that I'm aware of where there is no church, where there is no representation of his kingdom. And this is something that you and I can do Daily, whenever the Lord brings it to our minds in prayer, whenever the Lord brings it to our minds throughout the day, Lord, send, send laborers to such and such a place. Send laborers to such and such a place. Lord, send laborers to Howard County. Send laborers to, to, to the eastern shore of Maryland, to all the counties over there. Why? Because every person has to have an opportunity to experience the gospel in order for God to be considered just. In order for him to be considered just, everybody's got to have an opportunity. So this is something that we can do. You and I can participate in. Chapter 10, verse 1, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. In the KJV, this, this is rendered as power, but the Greek word is, is exousia, 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 whichever you want to, whichever you prefer, but it translates to the English word authority. He gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. This is directly connected to the end of chapter 9. This is Jesus doing exactly what he said they should pray for, for the Father to do. He is sending them out for the purpose of being laborers in the harvest. And he's giving them the same authority that he carries. He is giving them nothing different than he himself was endowed with from the Father. So when you and I are baptized in Jesus' name, we're filled with the Spirit of God. We are given authority to participate as laborers in the harvest. Is this boring enough yet? Let's see how much slower I can go. I'm trying to put some of y'all to sleep. I really am. If I get about 10 of y'all to sleep, I will consider this a success. So if you feel it coming, don't resist. Just yield. It's the will of God. Verse 2. 
The names of the 12, of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot. What in the name of the Lord is happening here? There's something else. Mic check. Okay, so it must not be me. This is all the way off. Hello? Hello? You there? Can you hear me now? Okay, praise God. Thank you. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is important because whenever Jesus sends us out, he gives us parameters of operation. You are not called to reach everybody. You're not. But you are called to reach those that he's sending you to. And he's proclaiming to, he says, proclaim to them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. These are commands. These are not something that he wants them to try to do. This is something that he is commanding them to do based on the authority he has put in their hand. Now, just in case you doubt that there's, this is scriptural here, go to, um, I'll just, I don't really want to do it this way, but let's go to the book of Exodus real quick. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4. I believe it's chapter 4. That's chapter 8. Pages are stuck together. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Do, 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 do. Where is it? What verse is it? Oh, it's verse. Excuse me while I search. Ah, there it is. Verse 21. Excuse me. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in. Oh, put in thine hand. Yeah. That I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart, that's Pharaoh, so that he will not let the people go. So this is the same concept that's being introduced to us back in Matthew chapter 10. When you are baptized in Jesus' name and you're filled with the Spirit of God, it is not a question as to whether or not you have authority to pull people out of Egypt. When it comes to you pulling people out of Egypt, when it comes to you reaching a lost soul, when it comes to you being a laborer in the harvest, you have authority and power with God to execute miracles for the purpose of the salvation of that soul. You do. Whether it be, whether it be commanding a revelation to come upon them so that they see the truth, 
whether it be praying for them and seeing a, a, a sickness go, whether it be speaking a word of authority and a demon being cast out in front of you from them. You have that authority because you are in the name of Jesus. This is not a question. This is not a question. Verse 9, acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or, your st- or a staff. For the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. Verse 12, as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. What is the context? <clears throat> that Jesus introduces here for the expansion of the kingdom. It's a key word. Go back to verse 12, please. It's a noun. Begins with an H, ends with an E. Trying to give you a hint. Can somebody call out, what's that word? House. House. This is the context for the expansion of the kingdom. One hundred percent. This is the context. Here's why. I'm going to break out my calculator to do this for you. So, in in this time, you know, there's 24 hours in a day in on Earth, right? So. There's 24 hours in a day times 7, 168 hours in a week, right? Is that, everybody agrees that this is right? Okay, praise the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry, I did tell you you could go to sleep. My bad, (laughs) my bad. Okay, so we are in church three days a week. I'm normally here for about three hours, so let's go with that. So three hours times three, that's nine hours of time. So nine divided by 168 times 100 gives us 5.35% of the time I spend here at the church in a seven-day period. It is impossible for me to experience everything that Jesus commanded us to do in verse 8 in 5.35% of my time. It's impossible. So the problem is not We're not seeing this stuff because because we've, well, I can't say it that way. The problem is we are not seeing this stuff because we have our context backwards. We are supposed to be doing this stuff out in the other 94.7% 5% of the time. We're supposed to be seeing this stuff done in our workplaces, at the grocery stores, in our neighborhoods. And then when we come together, we are to celebrate all that God has done in our lives. But, man, I was hoping I didn't have to say this. But the reason, one of the reasons is we like to go home and cast off restraint. Home is my haven. Home is my fort. It's my outpost for the kingdom of God. Yeah, it is. How much of God's stuff are you doing in your neighborhood?
And lest you think I'm being hypocritical, this is stuff the Lord's dealt with me about, and I am, oh, oh, he is working me over. He's not letting me get away from it. So I'm not preaching to you something that I am perfect at. I am preaching to you something that he is actively ministering to me about. He is changing my perspective. I am still ruminating on all of this. This is not done. We go home from work. We're tired. We go home from wherever. We come and we, we, we want to relax. We want to watch a movie. We want to we just do whatever we want to do. But what we have to remember is that there is a context for the expansion of the kingdom that must be remembered when we are at home. If I had to guess, I would say less than 20% of the people in this room have relationships with their neighbors. Again, this is just a guess. This is not, I haven't conducted a poll, so... Why? Again, we want to do things our way. I want to do things my way. I want to come home and relax and whatever. But what about the people that are on their way to hell within the 30 yards of your front door? Again, you are not called to reach everyone. You're not called to reach everyone. You literally can't reach everybody. But the places where we frequent the most, those are the places where our authority is most in tune. But we never get a chance to experience it because we cast off restraint once we get into our comfort zone. We do. We cast off restraint. We remember the Lord. We do. We, we remember him as a thought, but we fail to engage the harvest field anywhere but the church. But Jesus clearly says that the context for the expansion of the kingdom is houses. Now, culturally, culturally, we can, we, we can take that term and we can try to manipulate it and, make, and, and create some additional context, okay? So we can say, you know, uh, when you come to a Panera Bread, greet it. When you come to a Starbucks or a Rise Up or, or you come to a um, Jersey Mike's or a Subway, greet the house that you come upon in. And if your peace returns to you. <laughs> so we, we can, we, culturally, we can create some additional context without stretching, the, without stretching it too much, okay? Um, but there's no way you can spin this without breaking the context to say that if you, you, let me rephrase that, you can't make this happen in the four walls of the church without breaking the context. You absolutely cannot. You absolutely cannot. I'll, I'll tell you one way the Lord dealt with me about this a few years ago. I was in, we were in a church service, it was red hot, it was Smoking, there was, you know, somebody was spinning on their heads out in front and fire, lights, and the spirit was powerful. And the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to tell so-and-so X, Y, Z. And I said, okay. And I go over to tell him, and he said, no, hold, ah, hold, 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 hold. I'm like, oh, so that wasn't a green light? No, the light's still red, check. Oh, you're right, Lord, the light is red. Why is the light red? He said, because I want you to do this tomorrow. Sure, that's fine. And, and it kept happening, and it, ha it happened again, and it happened again, until I finally came to and realized 
the Lord had completely expanded the context of ministry for me to say, this is not about the building. This is about you functioning as a person of the kingdom all the time. This is about you making space in your life to do, to do what I'm asking on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is not just about the building. And that was the that was that was kind of that was a st- the start for me. I, I, I got to confess that that was that was when I started picking up on this theme in my own life, where he where I where he started trying to break me of the habit of putting all of this into the box of a church service. So this is the context that, we, that we're in, okay? The context of apostolic ministry, doing ministry the way Jesus did. My, one of the studies that I have coming up, I say it because the Lord brought it to me earlier today, was to see how many times in the Gospels Jesus ministered in a house or how many times the word house is in the Greek New Testament. I haven't done it yet because it just came up today, but I'm, I'm going to start on that tomorrow. Because it's important for us to put the principles of the Scripture in the context in which they're mentioned. It, the context, is, context is, is so important when it comes to the Scripture. So can you put Matthew chapter 10, verse uh, 13 back up on the screen, please? All right. We're going to go to John chapter 20 in just a moment. But Jesus says here, if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. And if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Part of of this explanation here is that if, if you go somewhere, as a person of the kingdom. And you have peace when you get there. That peace is an indicator that your authority is resting there. And if you have peace there, which means your authority is resting there, that means your authority in the kingdom can be exercised there to great effect. That's what, this, that's what this is implying here. This is, I, I, I used to get really confused when I read this. I didn't understand what exactly he's talking about. But in the context of everything he's mentioning about kingdom demonstration, what he is saying is where, wherever I send you and you begin to inquire as to whether or not the people within a particular residence are open to the gospel, if they respond in the affirmative, that is an indicator that Authority, peace, and demonstration can, up, can come upon that residence. And the, the goal of this, of this practice is not just to get in there, do a few things, declare the gospel, and walk out. But the goal there is to create another f- follower of Jesus. That's the whole point. Verse 14, and if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that particular town. Go back to verse uh, 14, please, and just... Leave it there for just a moment. Thank you. How many of you, let's not do it that way. (laughs) 
from my experience, there's not much, there's not many things more demoralizing than having the gospel shoved back in your face. As a matter of, you know, I guess you could call it pride, whatever. But the gospel is free. Why would anyone refuse it? And I've, in the past, gotten so upset and distraught and nearly lost my own salvation because somebody chose to go to hell versus going to heaven. When there is clear scripture here that tells me that I need to just move on and go to the next person. As has been said a few times here tonight, you are not called to reach everyone. You're not called to save every life. And even if you are called, they may not respond in the way that you want them to or the way that the Lord wants them to. But that is not your job. It's not my job. I used to think it was my job. It's not my job. It's my job to minister the gospel, demonstrate the kingdom as he has led me to while I'm there, and let them and the Holy Ghost decide whether or not they're going to follow Jesus or not. Now, if you'll go with me to John, the book of John, we're going to uh, skip... We're going to skip a few things that there are, uh, for additional context, I, I encourage you to read um, in, uh, I encourage you to read in, math, in um, um, Mark chapter 6, in Luke chapter 9 additional context for Jesus sending out his disciples. Um, there's a, a lot of different things in there that you can learn. You can also look at Matt, Luke chapter 10. Mark 3, Mark 6, Luke 9, and Luke 10. Very, very interesting passages of scriptures um, about Jesus sending his, his followers out and I, I encourage you to, to, to look at those. John chapter 20. And we're going to look at, uh, start at verse 19. here in just a minute. It's real quiet in here. Praise God. I love it. Who says apostolic people can't be quiet? You should be here right now. My goodness. This is beautiful. I love it. I love it. John chapter 20 verse 19. Jesus Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection earlier in this chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for, for fear of the Jews. Ooh, Jesus came and stood among them. <laughs> Can you picture this with me? Okay. You are the 12 apostles. <laughs> and Jesus has just been resurrected. The authorities are after you for stealing his body. You are in some room somewhere with the door locked, huddled over a table, and out of nowhere, Jesus just shows up. That's right. Wait, how, how'd you get in here? The door is locked. Like, if, if I'm me, if, if I'm Peter, I'm sitting there, I see him there, the first thing I do is, is the door closed? How did you get in here? I don't, that's just really funny to me. Can, I can tell some of you don't share my amusement, but that's really funny to me. And he says to them, peace be with you. <laughs> yeah. 
Hey, guys, it's me. It's really me. Don't be scared. This is cool. This is good. I just came through the wall, but it's okay. You've never seen anything like this before. It's fine. Don't worry about it. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then disciples were glad when they saw it. He had to prove it was him, okay? That's what's happening here. He had to show them proof. Hey, this is really me. Otherwise, they weren't, they weren't going to be fooled. And he says, peace be with you. And here is the first part of what we would consider the Great Commission. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so even so I am sending you. He is officially sending them to the harvest. This is the first part. Now let's go to, uh, let's skip over to the book of Mark, skip backward to the book of Mark, chapter 16. And we'll read a few verses here. The resurrection happens at the beginning of the chapter. And we're going to start reading with verse 14. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the, at table. The reason there weren't twelve is because Thomas has already offed himself. Okay, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. Why did he need to do this? He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. For for context in the timeline, this is after he had talked to them the first time and told them he was sending them to go do some stuff. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. This is, multiple, this is now a second commissioning for them. It is evident that the apostles had the same problem we do. We just don't really believe it. Or we're too scared of the authorities that are going to be after us. But I got news for you. They're not after you yet. We are not being persecuted yet. Anybody that says, this is an attack on Christianity, it's not an attack yet. No, not yet. The enemy is still trying to formulate and get his plan. He's trying to see what we'll react to. It's not, it's not, we're not there yet. It's going to happen. If you read the rest of Matthew chapter 10, the, next, the ne- next verse after I stop reading actually starts talking about the persecution that is coming from being a follower of Jesus. Which is important because he told us ahead of time this was going to happen to us. And when that time comes, we will need boldness and courage in order for us to overcome the persecution that we are facing. Now let's go to the famous one, Matthew chapter 28. This is the third part of the Great Commission. Lacey, I just realized something. You know all those awkward moments that happen at um, Bible studies in our home? They have trained me for this. I've been trying to figure out why I've been doing that for so long. It's it's because of this moment. The Lord knew I was going to be up here listening to nothing but Bibles turn 
And he was like, I need Isaac to be okay with hearing quiet. I didn't realize that's what it was all about. I'm going to lean deeper into this. This is going to be great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. All right. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. We're going to read through verse 20. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. So <clears throat> they left where they were. They had not yet left where they were after the second time. They have finally left. They're gone now. They've gone to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, this is what I'm telling you. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Can you put verse 20 back up, please? Thank you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Thank you very much. You're a rock star. I'm not sure who you are, but you're a rock star. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world or to the end of the age. Multiple times, Jesus getting the same message across. I'm sending you to the world. In Matthew chapter 6, Mark chapter 16, his command is, let me go back to it, oh, sticky pages. He says, go and preach and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Can you go back to verse, uh, Mark chapter 15, verse, Mark 16, verse 15, sorry. And then we'll go directly back to verse 20 of Matthew. Thank you. Preach the gospel to every creature. Or to the whole creation. That leaves no one out. That leaves no one out. We're not supposed to leave anybody out. Another, for, uh, another proof for this is Jesus is... Can you go back to Matthew chapter 28, verse 20? Just leave it up on the screen, please. So Jesus is... He's in the garden. And he's, he knows what's coming. He's, he's, had, he's had a meeting with Elijah and Moses, and they've told him, hey, bro, some things are about to go down. This is happening. There's nothing you can do about it. Because the Scripture does say that they told him all the things he was going to suffer in Jerusalem. So, all right, so I'm not making this up. Seeing some very blank stairs. Oh, it's sleepy stairs. That's what it is. <laughs> Those things are deceiving, man. <laughs> so he's um he's he, he's at the in the garden. They arrest him. They send him before the high priest. And they start challenging him and all this stuff. And one of the remarks he makes to to is that he says, Everything I've done, I have done in public. I have not tried to hide anything. Same principle here. Observe all things. Preach the gospel to the whole of creation, to every creature. We can't do this in a secret place. Now, obviously, if the Lord declares to you to be, to be precise or to be um, discreet in the presentation of the gospel, you must obey. You must obey. 
I've been in situations where people have, in, in, in a public place, asked me very specific questions about the gospel. And I've started to share, and before I knew it, I was, I wouldn't say preaching, but within a 30-foot radius, you could easily hear what I was saying. Didn't do it on purpose, but it was like my internal volume knob just kind of, mm. And, I, and I, I, I've, I've questioned, and I've ruminated, and I've meditated, why has that taken place? And the only thing I can come back with is that I believe the Lord puts us in situations to cast seed broadly. And he wanted some people who were not directly connected to that conversation to hear the gospel. And so it was a little uncomfortable. And then, and then we just continued. So we've got to do it to the whole of creation. This is not something we can, we can hide under a bushel. This is not something we can disregard. If we're going to do it, we must do it to the whole of creation. In, our, in, our, in the 21st century, there is, there, there is almost no excuse from sharing, for sharing the gospel, for not sharing the gospel. I, I don't have social media. When I had one, I misused it. I, and I, I mean that. I did not use it in a... I, I posted scripture mostly and... That was what I did, but I did not use it as a vehicle for the gospel to be spread. I used it as a vehicle for Isaac to gain more followers. And so Jesus and I decided that it was not something that I needed in my life. But if you're on social media and you are more interested in propagating conspiracy theories, and political views, I have some serious questions for you about whether or not you are, intended, you are spreading the gospel. Now, I, I understand that we all have interests, and you are allowed to have your interests in those things, 100%. But Moses told the children of Israel, who is on the Lord's side? When it comes to the things of this world, there are, there are three options. There is the right side, the, left, the right side, the left side, and God's side. And I'm not sure which side God's going to be on. So if you are more interested in communicating which side of an opinion you're on, rather than communicating that you were on God's side, you're not spreading the gospel. At the, at the most, you are generating more strife. At the most. Or at the, at the least. At the least, you're gender, generating more strife. And hopefully, nobody's reading your post. <laughs> but I somehow doubt that. <laughs> Praise God. I feel like this would be a good time for a joke. Let's see if I have one. I know some of you think I'm joking. I'm not. Let's see what we got here. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. What did the mountain climber name his son? Cliff. <laughs> Cliff. 
<laughs> Next time, shout it louder. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? Is this a good one? <laughs> That's a good one. All right, here's the last one. This is the last one. I'm only giving you two. I'm only giving you two. You needed a break, so I'm, here's the, this is the last one you're getting. Have you heard about cor- <laughs> corduroy pillows? They're making headlines. <laughs> Isn't that what good? Isn't that good? <laughs> Brother Brown, are you writing these down? You're right. Brother Brown needs to be writing these down. These are, this is good material right here. <laughs> you can sleep on that one. <laughs> Don't sleep on it. Don't sleep on it. Whatever you do, don't sleep on it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Praise God. Luke chapter 24, verse, 40, verse 44. Good job, everybody. Praise the Lord. That was funny. <laughs> Pastor, if you're watching, next time they're disinterested, tell them a joke. It works. It works. I've tested it out. I also may never get the microphone again. But you know what? God is still good. God is still good. Hey, God is good. God is good. <laughs> Luke chapter 24, verse 44. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. All right. This is one of my new favorite verses. Go to verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Jesus reached inside their understanding and turned a light on so that they could understand. This is something that I have been praying daily since it came to my attention. If you go back earlier in the chapter, verse 32, he says, they, it says, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scriptures. Why would I ever read the scriptures without, number one, Jesus explaining it to me, and number two, asking him to open my mind to understand them? This is something we should be praying every day. Verse 46, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. That repentance, verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. This is something that we're supposed to do when we're proclaiming the gospel. Preach repentance and remission of sins in the name of Jesus to all nations. To all nations. To all nations. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, nope, that's not Acts, that's John. Whoops. I tricked myself, but I got untricked real fast. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2, 
until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom. Verse 4. And while staying with them, this is Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed in, by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This is the last piece. It is, he gives us all this authority to do things. And I want you to, I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. This is, I, I don't know if we really understand this. And I'm not sure I understand it yet. Jesus gave authority to his followers to demonstrate the kingdom before they had received the indwelling spirit of God. Before he, he received, they, before. So by that definition, there could be someone, and I'm saying someone because I, I don't know anybody personally that, that is this effective. There could be someone on the earth not spirit-filled, demonstrating the kingdom of God. They would be like Apollos, somebody that would receive the teaching of the scriptures more perfectly, receive the spirit, and then continue on. The authority of the kingdom is powerful. I was in prayer one day, and I was praying for some friends of mine, and the Lord said, I want you to pray that so-and-so would be a witness of me to someone today. And I was like, okay. Seemed pretty general, so I was like, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I, and I can't remember exactly how I prayed it, but I spoke the word of authority, went about my day, got a phone call the next day. Hey, <clears throat> what you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? So we small talk, we go back and forth, and they said, guess what happened yesterday? Like, what? And they described this story to me. And when I went back in, went back in my memory, Within hours of praying that, th that prayer had been answered. But they were also more than 500 miles away when it happened. And I, I said to the Lord, it was one of these moments where I was like, uh huh. I was like, authority travels. And it travels fast. And the spirit world, we're all connected. And when you speak it, and it's, it's him, it has to be done. And uh, that, was a, that was a powerful lesson. Because it, opened, it opens an entirely new world to your prayer life. Because you don't have to be present to do everything. You can speak it. And that's what I was talking about earlier, about participating with the Lord as a laborer in the harvest. If we are willing to do that in prayer, 
we can be way more effective than just having to take on the responsibility of us doing all the work. That's not supposed to be the goal. Now, it is 7.33, I have more notes. <laughs> and I, I do feel to go on. So we're just going to do one more section, I, I believe. Lord, is that right? Can you go with me to Matthew chapter 13? I promise I will be done as soon as the Holy Ghost is done. I have been mostly effective. I've seen numerous people asleep at this point. So uh, this has been an awesome night. This has been an awesome night. Praise God. I do want you to know that um, I don't think the pastor would <laughs> feel the same way about <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> so we might want to try not to do that next week. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1. This is the parable of the sower. The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and he sowed some seeds. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Verse 5, Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. Verse 6, but when the sun arose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they were withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced again, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Here's something interesting here. This is, this is very interesting. We are not all called to produce the same amount of yield. We're not. You and I are different. You and the person next to you are different. And the scripture clearly says here that some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. You and I have to get comfortable with the idea that this is not a competition. This is not about how much you preach or how much I preach or, or how many demons I've cast out, how many demons you've cast out, or how many people have I seen healed versus how many people you've seen healed. It's not, it's not about any of that. Because we're all going to have a different yield. The thing that we must remember is that we are all laborers in this harvest. There is no one of us that is greater than the other. In fact, Jesus, Jesus said, when his disciples got into a squabble about competition, he said, he that is the greatest among you should be what? The servant to all. Every once in a while, I get a whiff of somebody being jealous of <clears throat> our bishop's ministry. And I got to tell you, once you understand authority and how it works, you don't necessarily ask to go higher. You know why? Because the man that lives less than a mile from here, maybe, maybe less than two miles from here, is a servant to a lot of people. A lot of people. Some, some people that you and I may never meet because that's what God has called him. It is not your job or my job to be jealous of the yield of somebody else's ministry. 
We are called to operate in the talents within the parameters of the authority God has given us. So let's not squabble about that. Um, is this the one? I don't think it's this one. No, it's not this one. Um, this parable shows up again in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 8, verse 4 through 8. The explanation of this parable in the book of Matthew is Matthew chapter 13, verse 18 through 23. And the explanation in Luke is Luke 8, verse 9 through 15. Okay. But I want to skip down, I want to skip to um, another parable. Matthew chapter 13, verse 30, verse 24. This is the parable of the weeds and the tares, the wheat and the tares, if you have KJV. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. Verse 25. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? He said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Verse 30, Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles and be, for them to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Skipping down to verse 36, this is the explanation of that, of that parable. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he said, verse 37, No one, the one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. This is, he's talking about himself here. The field is the world. When Jesus says, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest, he's saying, pray for the Lord of the harvest to send forth people into the field, to send forth people into the world. That's what he's trying to get at. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who, who ha, he who has ears, let him hear. And finally... I want to go to the book of Acts. Because after all this, after all these explanations from the Gospels, it's important that we understand and see how the disciples, how the apostles took action on this stuff. It's very important for us to, to know that part. So let's go to Acts chapter 2. So Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Uh, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a, rushing, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And tongues of fire sat upon them, and they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. So this is the infilling of the Spirit. This is the promise of the Father that Jesus gave and said, this is what's going to happen to you. All right, now, skipping to the end of the chapter, let's go to verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and, and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the, 
the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Here is where we see the context for the kingdom expansion that the disciples, the apostles, the followers of Jesus took after Jesus ascended. Because it was their culture, they continued daily in the temple. Now, I will ask you this question, only because I want you to think about it. How many of you, no, I won't say it that way. <clears throat> it is my opinion. But the bar, this is my opinion. This is not your opinion. This is my opinion. This is not Brother Yu's opinion. This is my opinion. Does everybody understand whose opinion this is? Okay. Just want to make sure. This is my opinion. I don't believe that 3,000 people showed up at the temple every day at one time to worship. Because if they did, a riot would have broken out. You have to remember, Jesus had opened their mind to understand the scriptures. They understood that Jesus was Yahweh come in the flesh. The other Jews didn't know that yet. They were still worshiping Yahweh, but did not understand that Jesus was Yahweh come in the flesh, that Yahweh, Jesus was their king. They didn't understand that yet. So because they're Jews and they believe Yahweh is God, why wouldn't they continue going to the temple? Because that's where, you, that's where they were, went to worship. But also, that wasn't where they expanded the kingdom only. They took this thing from house to house. And the scripture says that they were very effective. What would happen if you and I would be serious with ourselves about sharing the gospel, not just in our homes to each other, but in our homes to our neighbors? in our homes to those that we're not immediately drawn to, but they're in our proximity and we're drawn to them by the Holy Ghost. This is not for just a special few. This is something for everyone. This is not about the pastor, this is not about other ministers in our congregation. We're blessed with so many. We're best blessed with so many men, men and women of God that are called to lead us and, and protect us in this flock. So many. But this is not about them. This is about all of us right. and the family of God right. having a responsibility to be a beacon, a portal, an access point by which the world can touch the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God can touch them. That's what this is about. There are more things I could, 
that could be said here. It has not been my intention to give a comprehensive explanation, but to release what the Lord has, has been dealing with me about in sharing the gospel. And I, it is my prayer in my faith that there have been some things dropped in your spirit that will cause you to start thinking a little bit differently about how you operate in the kingdom and how you operate in this world. Let's stand and pray together. Praise God. I don't know what you believe and what you sense in the Holy Ghost, but I, there is, just have this very, uh, I don't know how to explain it other than an excitement in my spirit right now. Let's give, let's lift our hands as a, as a, as a family, as a, as brothers and sisters, and let's give thanks to the Lord. That's it. Let's give thanks to the Lord for, for what he has said to us this evening. Yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you've done here, Father. We thank you for expounding to us the scriptures. We thank you for opening our minds to understand. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Ah, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, let the Spirit bear witness right now. Let the Spirit bear witness with your spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He orobonda la baha samanda ha yesu. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Shake hands, be, be friendly. Let's go and expand the kingdom together. In Jesus' name, Brother Barb.